Welcome back to Biomechanics. Today we will introduce viscoelasticity. As we have seen, soft tissues in cells exhibit several anelastic properties, including hysteresis during loading and unloading, stress relaxation at constant strain, creep at constant stress, and strain rate dependence. In general, we can say that stress in soft tissues depends on the strain and the history of the strain. And these properties can be modeled by the theory of viscoelasticity. The simplest class of viscoelastic models are linear viscoelastic models, in which the stress depends on both the strain and the strain rate. So T is a function of epsilon and epsilon dot. Examples of models like this are the Maxwell fluid model, modeled as an elastic spring in series with a viscous syringe, a Voigt solid model modeled as an elastic spring in parallel with a viscous syringe, and a Kelvin solid model modeled as a Maxwell fluid in parallel with an elastic spring. In these models, the spring represents the elastic stress, which depends on the strain, and the syringe represents the viscous stress, which depends on the strain rate. Strains add in series, for example, the strain in this Maxwell fluid is the sum of epsilon 1, the strain in the syringe, and epsilon 2, the strain in the spring. And the stresses in series are equal, so the stress in the syringe and the stress in this spring are the same because they're in series. In parallel, stresses add, so in the Voigt solid, the stress in the syringe adds to the stress in the spring to be the total stress, T1 plus T2, whereas it's the strains that are the same in each side. So we can use these rules to derive equations for these different linear viscoelastic models. Let's start with the Maxwell fluid model. The total strain in the model is epsilon 1, the strain in the syringe, plus epsilon 2, the strain in the spring. So therefore the total strain rate must be the strain rate in the spring plus the strain rate in the syringe or dash pot. Therefore epsilon dot is epsilon 2 dot plus epsilon 1 dot. Now in the spring epsilon 2 is related to T by E, the elastic constant. So therefore epsilon 2 dot must be T dot over E. In the dash pot T is related to epsilon 1 dot, the rate of strain, by mu, the viscous coefficient. So epsilon 1 dot is T over mu. Since the strains and therefore the strain rates add in series, we get that epsilon dot equals T dot over E plus T over mu. In other words, we have a linear first order ordinary differential equation with two constant coefficients, E the elastic constant and mu the viscous constant. We can now solve this linear ordinary differential equation for different prescribed conditions. For example, we could prescribe the stress time course and from that integrate to obtain the strain time course. Or we could prescribe the strain time course and from that integrate to obtain the stress solution. So for the relaxation solution, we solve this equation for the case of constant applied strain epsilon naught. So our equation t dot plus e over mu times t, which will simplify to t dot plus lambda t, where lambda is e over mu, will equal epsilon naught dot, and since epsilon naught is a constant applied strain, that is zero. So now we're solving t dot plus lambda t equals zero. So the solution for this is easy. We recognize this to be a decaying exponential of the form t equals a e to the minus lambda t. To find the constant a, we apply the initial condition, so that is the stress t at time zero, which we'll call t naught, and therefore a in this solution would be just t naught, because at time equals zero, e to the minus lambda t is one. But what is t naught? Well, if we look at our model, we'll see that it's a spring in series with a syringe, so instantaneously all the strain, epsilon naught, will be in the spring. Therefore, the instantaneous stress T naught will be 
the strain in the spring, epsilon naught, times E, the elastic modulus. Therefore, T naught is epsilon naught E, and therefore the stress T is epsilon naught E, E to the minus lambda T. We can now evaluate this solution at different times. As we prescribed, at time t equals zero, t will equal epsilon naught e, which is t naught, and the ratio of t to epsilon naught will be e. So e will be e naught, the instantaneous elastic modulus. At time t equals infinity, the stress will have completely decayed to zero, so e to the minus lambda t as t tends to infinity tends to zero. So the ratio between the stress and the strain at time t equals infinity is actually zero. And we say that the asymptotic elastic modulus in this problem is zero. We can plot this solution, and so we can see that our decaying exponential as t tends to zero will eventually decay to zero, asymptotically to zero stress. This is a mono-exponential decay, and as an exercise you should check that our original ordinary differential equation 1 on the previous slide is satisfied by this solution. Next, let's look at the Voigt solid model. In this model, the spring is in parallel with the syringe, which prevents the syringe from extending indefinitely. And so that, unlike the Maxwell model, this model is a model of a solid type behavior with viscous properties rather than a fluid-like behavior with elastic properties. So in this case, it's the stresses that add, and the total stress T is the stress in the spring, T2, plus the stress in the syringe, T1. The stress in the spring is E, the elastic modulus, times the strain, and the stress in the syringe is mu times the strain rate, epsilon dot. Note that the strain in both elements is the same because they're in parallel. So again, we have a linear first-order ordinary differential equation to solve relating the stress T to the strain and the strain rate, epsilon. Integrating, this time for a constant applied stress, T naught, we again can show easily that we have an exponentially decaying solution where epsilon is equal to a e to the minus lambda t plus a constant, which is t naught over e. Remember, in our solution of the relaxation solution for the Maxwell model, we had zero on the right-hand side. Well, now we have uh, this constant t naught over e. Now, lambda here is also 1 over the time constant for relaxation, which is called the relaxation time. And recalling that lambda was e over mu, that means that the relaxation time is mu over e. And that makes sense. The larger the viscous element is, the viscosity term is relative to the elastic term, the slower the creep of this model will be. In the limit, when there is no syringe at all, then the response would be instantaneous. Again, we have to use our initial conditions to find the unknown A. Our initial condition this time is that at time zero, the strain is zero. That's because it takes a finite amount of time to displace the syringe, unlike the spring. So therefore, epsilon zero equals A plus T naught over E equals zero. And therefore, A is equal to minus T naught over E. So therefore, the solution becomes epsilon equals T naught over E times 1 minus E to the minus E over mu times T. So this is the creep solution where we see the strain now starts at 0 and it increases for a constant stress with a decreasing rate in a exponential fashion. Again, you can check that the original ordinary differential equation that we derived for the Voigt solid model is satisfied by this solution. Again, we can look at the asymptotic and instantaneous elastic moduli. This time, it's the stress that's constant and the strain that's changing. As time tends to infinity, epsilon at infinity tends to T naught over E, so therefore the asymptotic elastic modulus E infinity is just E. The instantaneous elastic modulus epsilon naught is the ratio of the stress to the strain at time zero, but the strain at time zero in the Voigt solid is zero, 
and therefore the instantaneous elastic modulus of the Voigt solid is infinity. So to summarize, based on the creep solution derived for the Voigt solid model and the relaxation solution derived for the Maxwell fluid model, we found that the instantaneous elastic modulus was infinity for the Voigt solid and E, the elastic modulus of the spring for the Maxwell fluid, whereas the asymptotic elastic modulus was the elastic constant E for the Voigt solid and zero for the Maxwell fluid. Real viscoelastic materials don't generally have an infinite instantaneous elastic modulus. So to avoid this, we can use three parameter models or even more elements. There are various possible configurations. For example, the Kelvin standard linear solid model looks like this. It's a Maxwell fluid in parallel with a spring. So now you can see the spring will prevent the Maxwell fluid from flowing indefinitely and the stress relaxing all the way to zero. So this is a solid model. Equivalently, we can take a Voigt solid model and put a spring in series with it. This now avoids the instantaneous elastic modulus of the Voigt solid being infinite. Both of these models have two springs and one syringe. They're both viscoelastic and they're both solid-like, and in fact they both behave the same way, but their parameters for the same behavior would be different because the arrangement of the spring and the syringe is different. They're like equivalent circuits in linear circuits. It's easy to see, for example, that they both have a finite instantaneous elastic modulus. They'll both stretch instantaneously. In the case of this three-parameter model, you can see that the instantaneous elastic modulus would just be E prime, whereas the instantaneous elastic modulus in this model would be some combination of E prime and E double prime. Conversely, in the limit as time tends to infinity, in this model, all of the stress would be lost from the syringe and therefore there'd be no stress in the spring so the asymptotic elastic modulus of this model would be E prime whereas the asymptotic elastic modulus of this model would be some combination of E prime and E double prime. Let's formulate the equations for this version of the three parameter model. So in this model we can say that T is equal to epsilon prime times E prime because that's the tension in this spring. It's also equal to the sum of epsilon double prime times E double prime plus mu double prime times epsilon dot double prime, the rate of change of epsilon double prime. Now we know that the total strain epsilon is epsilon prime plus epsilon double prime, and therefore the total strain rate epsilon dot is epsilon prime dot plus epsilon double prime dot. We can therefore use these relations to combine these terms and write that epsilon dot must equal t dot over epsilon prime because epsilon prime is equal to t over e, so epsilon prime dot must be t dot over e prime. And then that will add to epsilon double prime dot, which we can see is t minus e double prime times epsilon double prime divided by mu double prime. So we get therefore that epsilon dot is equal to t over e prime plus t minus e double prime times, now substituting in terms of epsilon, this would be epsilon double prime is epsilon minus epsilon prime, and epsilon prime is t over e prime, so we get t minus e double prime times epsilon minus t over e prime, all divided by mu double prime. Then we can rearrange that to write that E prime plus E double prime times T plus mu double prime times T dot is equal to E prime plus E double prime times epsilon plus E prime times mu double prime times epsilon dot. So again, we have a linear first order ordinary differential equation relating T and its first derivative to epsilon and its first derivative. So this is the slightly more general case than the previous two where we had either T being a function of E and epsilon dot or epsilon being a function of t and t dot. So in general, we can say that stress and stress rate are a function of strain and strain rate in these linear viscoelastic models. Now, in order to solve this, we need to specify either the stress or the strain. So if we specify the time course of the strain, then we'll be able to evaluate epsilon and epsilon dot, 
and this will become a known right-hand side, and we'll have a first-order ordinary differential equation to solve for t. Conversely, if we know the stress and not the strain time course, we can prescribe here t and t dot, and then we'll have a first-order ordinary differential equation in terms of epsilon and epsilon dot. So, for example, in the case of creep, we specify that the stress is constant, so the stress is equal to t naught, or more precisely, it's equal to t naught times u of t, where u of t is the unit step function, because the stress will actually change from 0 to t naught at time 0. The unit step function is the function that goes from 0 to 1 at time t equals 0. And so we can then plug that in to one side of the equation and then solve the resulting first order ordinary differential equation for the strain time course epsilon, which turns out to be t naught over e prime times e prime plus e double prime times 1 minus e to the minus lambda t, all over mu double prime times lambda plus e to the minus lambda t. Now, this is obviously a little more complicated than the previous solutions, but mathematically, it's exactly the same class of problem. We simply know that this is going to have an exponential and we solve for the constants using the known initial conditions. We know that lambda is e over mu, so therefore this simplifies to t naught over e prime times e prime plus e double prime over e double prime times one minus e to the minus lambda t plus e to the minus lambda t. And this solution, when the stress is a step function, is called the creep function c of t. And if we divide the creep function by the magnitude of the initial strain, epsilon naught, which in this case is no longer zero, then the resulting uh, function, normalized function, is called j of t, the reduced creep function. And again, the time constant, uh, 1 over lambda, is mu double prime over e double prime, or the rate constant lambda is e double prime over mu double prime. Looking at the case where t equals zero, we therefore get that epsilon naught would be equal to t naught over e naught by definition, where e naught is the instantaneous elastic modulus. And in this case, the instantaneous elastic modulus reduces simply to e prime. So this term goes away. At t equals zero, we get one minus one, and we get epsilon naught is t naught over e prime times one, which means that e naught is e prime. In the case when t tends to infinity, now this term disappears, this term goes to zero, and this term becomes one. So we now get that epsilon at infinity equals t naught times e prime plus e double prime over e prime times e double prime. And so that combination of e prime and e double prime is the asymptotic elastic modulus for this three parameter model. We can also derive the relaxation solution for this three-parameter model by this time prescribing that the strain is a step function, epsilon naught u of t. So the strain increases from zero to epsilon naught and stays constant. Again, we get an exponential solution, and it takes the form e prime e double prime over e prime plus e double prime times epsilon naught times one minus e to the minus e prime plus e double prime over mu double prime times t plus t naught e to the minus e prime plus e double prime over mu double prime times t. This is called the relaxation function k of t. And again, if we normalize k of t by dividing by the instantaneous initial stress t naught, the remaining function that starts at 1 is called the reduced relaxation function. If we evaluate the stress at time infinity, then we see that it's equal to e prime times e double prime over e prime plus e double prime times epsilon naught, because this term will disappear and this term will disappear, so we're just left with this. So in other words, this combination of e prime and e double prime here, again, is the asymptotic elastic modulus. And the instantaneous elastic modulus, you can see, for time t equals zero, this term disappears, and it's just e prime, as we saw before. So in summary, for linear viscoelasticity, we've seen that in viscoelastic materials, the stress depends on the strain and the strain rate. And in fact, in general, 
we find that the stress and the stress rate depend on the strain and the strain rate. They exhibit creep and relaxation and hysteresis. Viscoelastic models can be derived by combining springs with syringes. Three parameter linear models, such as the Kelvin solid, have exponentially decaying creep and relaxation functions, and their time constants are the ratio of the elastic terms to the damping, or viscous term. The instantaneous elastic modulus is the stress strain ratio at time t equals zero and is the same whether you compute it from the creep or the relaxation experiment. And the asymptotic elastic modulus is the stress strain ratio as the time t tends to infinity. And again, it's the same whether you obtain it from a creep or relaxation experiment.